the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day, Thursday, June 9th. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. Lagarde, we will deliver. The ECB president says the central bank will make sure inflation returns to its 2% target and leaves the door open to a 50 basis point hike in September. Spreads blow out. Equities sell off. Bond yields spike higher. Off the highs of the session, though, the Italian-German bond spread blows out to the highest in two years. It is the aftermath of the ECB. And Freeport LNG fire lights up natural gas. The company shuts down an export terminal in Texas, adding more stress to a tight global LNG market. We're going to speak to Francisco Blanche, Bank of America Securities Head of Global Commodities and Derivatives Research. From New York, I'm Alex Steele, my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. You know, Guy, Christine Lagarde must be very happy that this press conference was over. She really didn't go with the whatever it takes, stayed with gradual, but really tried to say, we're going to deliver, guys. Don't worry. We're going to deliver. Yeah, I, there's a lot of vagueness, uh, a lot of uncertainty around exactly what comes next. I was listening to Mohamed Alarian talking just a moment ago, talking about the idea that this was a paradigm shift. Um, I don't think we quite know yet the details of what the new paradigm is going to look like. Clearly, fragmentation is a concern. Lots of questions mm -hmm. on that during the press conference. Uh, but the ECB economists are really struggling to get a handle on this, aren't they? Growth downgrades, inflation upgrades. It's a bit of a one-two punch that we're getting here, Alex, isn't it? We're getting Christy Lagarde today and we get US CPI tomorrow. I think Friday afternoon, it's going to be an interesting point of reflection. Spoiler, it's going to be hot. Inflation will be hot. Um, let's get more to the ECB here. Uh, the bank committing to a quarter point increase in interest rates next month, also leaving the door open to a bigger hike in the autumn. Here's Christine Lagarde at today's press conference. We expect to raise the key ECB interest rates again in September. The calibration of this rate increase will depend on the updated medium-term inflation outlook. If the medium-term inflation outlook persists or deteriorates, a larger increment will be appropriate at our September meeting. Let's get more now from our Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who's in Amsterdam for that meeting. Uh, Maria, OK, September looks like a done deal. Do we have an idea, though, if it's going to be 25 or 50? Yeah, and Alex, a lot of this press conference, she repeated essentially what had been very well guided, calibrated. You know, we put the asset purchase program to an end. And then, of course, you hike in July. It's 25 basis points. So that's pre committed. That's in there. But again, to me, what was interesting is the way you go forward. She did say and repeated the European Central Bank is on a journey, that this is not step by step measures, but this all form a path. Now, when she was asked about September, you know, to me, she didn't really push back against the narrative that 50 basis point could, in fact, uh, happen. And I think essentially that's going to be the narrative from the next uh, three months. Particularly, we see inflation the way it is right now with prints that at times triple, quadruple the objective from the European Central Bank. So that's for uh, the inflation rate. I think the other important thing to come out of this uh, press conference, perhaps not as clear, however, was how does the European Central Bank deal with the market volatility that will come uh, with the rate hikes? And you're seeing already that reaction in the bond market, particularly in the VTP moves that we are seeing over the past hour. To me, it's ironic. Nonetheless, this marks the end of an era, perhaps a Mario Draghi era coming to an end. But we're back again talking about BTPs with Mario Draghi now in office. OK, let's talk about that fragmentation risk, Maria. Do we have any idea about the tools that are on offer, really, to deal with that fragmentation risk? Um, I was listening again to Mohamed Lalerian. He thinks they've got it. He thinks they do have the tools uh, to be able to deal with this. But this is so critical. If fragmentation occurs, and we've all lived through what fragmentation looks like, if that occurs again, transmission doesn't work. Does the ECB really have the tools here to be able to tackle this if it was to emerge once again? Well, she repeated that, that the European Central Bank, of course, will want to avoid that. She said, we've done it in the past, we will do it in the future, and we can adjust uh, tools. If they have specific one, they clearly did not reveal that. And it was underwhelming for, for a lot of investors. I think uh, they really wanted to find out, not just in the abstract, but like clear hints in terms of the shape and the form uh, that this tool would take, also the pain threshold potentially uh, that the European Central Bank uh, would take. And I think, to me, the fact that she was asked 
four times I counted. What about fragmentation? What about fragmentation? But did not go into detail, almost magnified uh, this idea that the ECB, if they have a tool they don't want to reveal, so perhaps that's jittery uh, for the market. And if they don't talk about it because they don't have yet or they don't have consensus around it, so that's more of a problem. That's more problematic, definitely, in the short term. Yeah, that was really the game-changing moment for the markets, where yields really pushed higher, where the euro wound up rolling over, uh, et cetera. There were also some questions basically on credibility. I mean, if I parse through the language, many reporters said, why should we believe you? Um, did she give a good enough answer to beef up ECB's credibility? Well, look, she repeated, right now, uh, European Central Bank is committed, of course, to bringing back inflation to target. The European Central Bank would do the job. She also conceded at this point it's not a desirable uh, level. She said that a number of times. But when it comes to the forecast, which persistently, of course, have been off the mark today, we got new projections both for growth and GDP. Again, you see big revisions happening there. She did say the mistakes are coming due to unpredictable factors that are not easy to model. So, again, refer to the war in Ukraine the impact that it has on Europe. And at times it's worth reminding ourselves that the impact that this has on the European economy is much bigger than it has on the UK and is much bigger than it would have on the United States. She also said there's elements of energy. It is difficult to predict the way forward when you have errors around uh, the pricing of such things. So overall, yes, she's trying to defend uh, the credibility of the bank. But I guess as always, when it comes to central banks, it's about the data is going to be about the numbers, isn't it? Um, and there's a lot still to, to go. Are we going to get significantly further, uh, significant further revisions, uh, both on the upside for inflation and the downside for growth? Great work today, Maria. Uh, looks lovely in Amsterdam. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. Uh, coming up, we're going to get market reaction to the ECB. Bridgewater's Karen, Karen Tambor uh, is going to be joining us. Uh, that conversation is next. This is Bloomberg. started by being a somewhat more hawkish outcome. And then the more I listened to President Lagarde, the more I realized that she was signaling this consequential change in the policy regime. This is a big deal, what went on in Europe. And I think the market reaction is indicative that the market is starting to understand that we've exited one regime and we've entered another regime. That was Bloomberg Opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian earlier on Bloomberg Television. Uh, welcome to Bloomberg Daybreak America. Uh, nope, that's the wrong show. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it happens when you're stepping from brain fog and fatigue. Alex has woken up about four years ago. <laughs> yep, I, I was out for four months and now I woke up four years ago. Um, okay, we're in Bloomberg Markets. Now let's get to the question of the day. Can central banks actually get inflation to 2%? Uh, Karen Carnal Kambor, co CIO of Sustainability at Bridgewater Associates, she joins us now, and she's one of Bridgewater's foremost experts on macroeconomics and FX markets. Karen, what, the way Mohamed Al Arian was talking about it, this was a, you know, a seminal moment. This is a huge game changer uh, for the ECB and then for central banks. And I'm wondering if you believe that we can actually get to 2% inflation. Hi, great to be here. I don't think with the amount of tightening that is currently priced in, we can get to 2% inflation. And so markets are starting to process the tightening is going to be necessary. Europe is finally getting, you know, the same type of market action that we got in the United States as the Fed was tightening, which is all assets are falling. Bonds and stocks fall at the same time. You don't get any diversification uh, across the two of them because inflation and the need to tighten is the driver. And when that happens, you know, you are trying to slow what is a very strong economy to cool inflation. But if you look at actually the amount of tightening that is currently expected, it's still not that significant relative to the strength in economies, relative to the self-sustaining momentum and in inflation. So will it slow the economy? Yes. But will it be sufficient yep. to get central banks back to their goal? No. Karen, isn't this the compromise we're going to have to live with, though? Nobody wants a recession. Nobody wants a significant slowdown that probably would be required to get inflation back to target. So we accept inflation in the 3 to 4% range, but we don't get the aggressive recession that would come with 2%. Isn't that the compromise we're now dealing with? 
I think you're exactly right, Guy. This is why it's really not easy to be in the shoes of policymakers right now. They're going to have to choose whether to make that trade-off, and it's really not an easy trade-off to make because you don't want to let inflation get out of control, and at the same time, it is painful to have the economy slow because of tightening. And it's especially painful if you're Europe, and part of the reason you're getting inflation are things like energy and food prices that you don't produce. And so it's this inflation mm -hmm. that's particularly painful, and you have to slow your economy if you literally just can't get enough energy to power it. And so we know from the 70s that central banks face in that situation really prefer not to over tighten because it's painful. And the more it's external, the more it's geopolitical, the more it's, you're not the producer making money from the inflation, the more painful it is. But we also know from the 70s that they can be behind for many, many years and it can get out of control. I think reasonable policymakers are going to disagree about what to do here. Mm -hmm. But the risk is that they fall behind and they're so scared to crack the economy, which is right now at such strong levels levels that uh, they just go too slow. So Karen, when you take a look at what happened to spreads, we talked about this a bit earlier with Maria, that the game changing moment really happened when she's like, we don't have a plan for spreads yet, but we're going to work on it kind of thing. Um, is there any plan that they can do to help tampen down spreads that would in essence then help support the economy and different countries while also being able to tackle that 2% inflation? I believe there's a tremendous amount the ECB can do. They've already shown us time and time again that if they think this is important, there is a lot they can do to handle periphery spreads. The main thing when I look at the market action is, look, look what's happened to credit spreads globally. It makes sense for all risky assets to be selling off into this environment. This is just a tougher environment. And so I'm not sure if I were the ECB that I'd be jumping ahead and making lots of plans for spreads just because the market moves so far. I'm sure they have many plans in their back pocket and they can control it uh, if it gets out of control. I read Greg's piece in the FT talking about how you guys are positioning around all of this. Karen, in the kind of environment of 3 to 4% inflation and slower growth. I, how do you navigate it? Just kind of walk me through what you think the building blocks of a portfolio in that kind of environment look like. Well, the challenging thing in that environment is that most people, most of their risk is in beta, in being long assets, and in holding assets and hoping to make a risk premium. And most risky assets, frankly, look terrible in the near term. So yes, over time, you believe that holding bonds, holding stocks, holding credit spreads, you will make a risk premium. But in an environment of rising inflation and a need to tighten into that, you get terrible performance sort of across the board. And so mm -hmm. one consideration is how much can you move towards more tactical positioning, alpha, actually you know, make money off of shorts. And the other big consideration, if you have to hold um, assets, is how much inflation protection can you get? If you're holding stocks and bonds and you've gotten used to the ideas that they're really diversifying, that's because growth was the dominant issue. And every time growth fell, you know, bonds could do well and vice versa. And today that's not the case. And so inflation protection is really what most investors uh, are missing, and adding that in at least helps the circumstances, but this is just a bad environment uh, for risky assets, and that's the reality for most investors. Um, what, where might a central bank put be? I feel like we know it's not in the equity market. Is it in the bond market? Is it going to be in the private market? I'm trying to get a sense of like where the biggest financial risk is that like the Fed and the ECB are gonna have to then respond to. I think if you're the Fed and the ECB, you would not be that worried today about a peak in financial assets. Hmm. Financial assets have outperformed the real economy for a decade plus. That's been engineered, that's how it's been working, that's been the desire. And now, I think it's completely within their desires to have financial assets underperform the real economy to a material extent. And you're seeing that, for example, as tech has cracked, as crypto has cracked, there's been an understanding that this is not that significant. This is not a significant risk for the Fed yet. They need to slow the economy to a degree, and it's healthy for it to start in areas where there were bubbles of overvaluation and pockets where a lot of money went when a lot of money was printed. And so it's pretty healthy for financial assets to do very poorly relative to the real economy for some time now in this environment. It's painful for investors, though, because we've just lived with a decade plus where constant financial assets did significantly better than the economy. So an investor could do great even as the economy was kind of mediocre at times. Okay, so let's, let's just come back to what I want to own at this point. You talk about the underrepresentation of inflation-based products in most people's portfolios. Commodity funds have come up a long way already, Karen. Are they going to go further? Um, linkers have done relatively well. Tips have done relatively well. Are they going to continue to outperform? When I look at the inflation options that I have, what, looks like, what still looks like good value within that basket? 
you're right, it's not great because what's happening in commodities is you do have inflation protection, but you also have significant idiosyncratic risk in every commodity that you hold, especially oil. You know, small changes in geopolitics can make a big difference. And obviously, growth matters a lot. And so, for example, um, in, any, in any commodity that's not oil, China is a huge part of the demand. And you can only imagine how much Chinese demand has slowed because of the zero COVID policy. And so, Commodities don't look nearly as well as they did when you just looked at generally high nominal growth, high nominal real growth, high nominal high real growth and high inflation. Once you kind of have high inflation but weakening real growth, commodities don't look as attractive as they did a few months ago. And while it still holds some, not nearly as good as it was a few months ago. And then same with linkers. I think you're in a situation where if you have to hold bonds, I would completely pick linkers over a nominal bond if I had that choice. If I had to hold a bond, I'd rather just get paid whatever CPI is and just receive it. And you know, if it comes up above expectations, it's not expected to be that high. I mean, you asked at the beginning, how likely is that inflation goes back to two? Linkers are basically pricing that they'll go back to you know something like two, two and a half. So I want to get paid anything they are above that. If I had, if I have to hold a bond, I'd rather change it to a linker rather than hold a regular bond. Uh, Karen, to that point, we got a question from a viewer, and this kind of ties into a guy who was just asking, um, what are your thoughts on emerging markets? If you've developed markets, central banks are really in kind of a bind. What about the higher yielding EMs? I really like some of the stock markets, especially because you're in this situation where just so much outperformance has been priced into the United States. And so you're already expecting that U.S. companies will keep taking market share from everyone for another decade to come. It's pretty hard to do that decade after decade after decade, and it means it's already in the pricing. Whereas a lot of the pricing in the emerging markets is frankly pretty terrible. And the other piece is that we just lived through this period where people had so much money, right? Consumers all got literally checks to their homes. So you saw a lot of money being printed going into many assets. And it actually didn't go into emerging markets. Typically, those are really popular risky assets when you have these boom periods. And instead, it went you know, to crypto, to tech. So emerging markets are not nearly as vulnerable as they typically are in this part of the cycle where money's starting to come out. Now, that doesn't mean they're not vulnerable at all. But as I said, they're not great options today. Some of the emerging market equity markets certainly look more attractive to me than being in the US, which is already priced to perfection. Just in terms of what you do want to be in right now, you talked about being short how do i what do i want to be short of karen uh well i still do not like nominal bonds very much um okay. <laughs> and increasingly i don't like u.s stocks very much because if you basically look at how much u.s stocks have fallen and you say a stock is just a series of cash flows discounted back to today yep you can attribute the entire decline in stocks just to higher bond yields just a higher discount rate back to today Actually, almost nothing has been priced in terms of a slowing in the economy, actually fewer cash flows rather than just a higher discount rate. Almost none of that's been priced. And if you look at the Fed raising rates at the rate that it is, and now the ECB raising rates, if you look at how much asset prices have fallen, it does not look very likely to me that you're not going to get a slowdown in the cash flows that companies are getting. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, you go back to the 70s and you had a very significant rise in risk premiums. Investors didn't want to hold stocks because you were in a situation that was just trickier to manage the economy because inflation was so volatile. That could happen today too. So I think the decline in stocks can confuse people and it might not be hard, it might be hard to not see with the naked eye that all that's happened is slightly higher rates a lot more could get priced into U.S. stocks in terms of an actually weaker economic outcome and volatile inflation. Which is kind of what you were talking about before, that like we could engineer an economy that's okay, a softish landing in the economy and then a hard landing within the markets. Um, just before you go, and this goes back to that FT piece also, what, what, what part of corporate credit is more vulnerable if cash flows are vulnerable and yields are rising? Well, I think if you're looking at individual companies, you have to basically ask, what is the chance that they can flow through the inflation that's coming back to their customers? And so probably the best case study of this is you look back at the 1970s, and there's huge differences between companies, whether they were actually able to flow back to their customers what that inflation was, or they had to take it and basically had terrible profit margins as a result. Now, in the 1970s, 30% of the U.S. stock market was resources. So we had a lot of companies, and same in the corporate credit markets, that they could benefit from inflation and clearly pass it on. Today, there are a lot fewer companies like that. Resource companies are you know, 3% of the stock market or something. And so you're in a situation where you really have to be looking at you know, people like retailers of much harder time. So you want to look at basically how likely do you think the company is, um, either from an equity or a debt perspective, to be able to handle that higher inflation environment. What do you think default rates go to in that kind of environment, Karen? 
I don't know if I can call a number, but really mm -hmm. I think a lot of the pricing uh, will not necessarily be about defaults. Like a lot of the corporate debt that people own is companies that are not close to default and you are dealing with how much risk premium you're putting on the volatility of inflation and how likely they are to be able to manage through that situation, not on sort of actual default rates. There, there's of course a tail that will actually default, but right now a lot of the pricing is basically a shift in the environment saying it's gonna be a harder environment to navigate rather than you know true default probabilities coming up. Hey, Karen, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. We think you're great. We love talking to you. Karen Carnell Tambor of Bridgewater, thank you very much for your time. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Ritika Gupta. Target has raised its quarterly dividend by 20%. The new payout implies a yield of about 2.8%. That is a full percentage point above Walmart's yields. The move comes after Target lowered its profit outlook for the second time in less than a month. Tesla staged a remarkable comeback in terms of its production over in China. The electric vehicle maker tripled its output in May from the month before, producing more than 33,000 cars. That is despite only recently getting its Shanghai factory back up to speed after the city's lockdowns. And Bloomberg's learned that a consortium of Apollo Global Management and Reliance Industries has made a binding offer for the international unit of Walgreens Boots Alliance. The proposal puts a value of about $6.3 billion on the business, which runs more than 2,200 boots drug stores across the UK. A rival group, Britain's ISA Brothers and TDR Capital, has considered dropping out. And that is your latest business bash. Guy. Rika, thank you very much indeed. Another UK company being bought up. There seems to be plenty of that around. Um, Alex, I, I'm th I keep thinking about what we've got going on in here in Europe and Christine Lagarde, and I keep putting it together with the story we got in, in the natural gas market. We don't know where the energy story is going in Europe. Every time we get the results of the latest staff projection from the ECB, they're way off where they were before. I don't know, as a central bank, how you make policy in such a volatile environment and make accurate predictions as to where economies are going, where a fire in, uh, a fire in the United States in an energy plant can completely knock you off course. Well, and I think the problem is, is that, in theory, those things should be transitory because they're gas, food, yep. etc. But if we're also dealing with a structural shift away from Russian energy and also away from fossil fuels in general, that's not structural. That's going to be a multi-year cyclical process. Uh, excuse me, that, that's a structural multi-year process. Um, and I think that that is a serious problem that, might, that may be underestimated that you can't fix by any amount of hikes that you do. I know, and that's the problem. Some of this stuff is out of the control of these central banks. Anyway, we're going to talk energy next. Francisco Blanche is going to be joining us from Bank of America. This is Bloomberg. We're just about an hour into the U.S. trading session. Stocks trading a little bit heavy. But now we're waiting for that CPI number in the U.S. tomorrow. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking some of those moves. Abigail? Alex, it really is all about that CPI number because this is a week-to-date chart, and you can see it's going to come down right to the wire. We've had uh, big up moves, a down move, up moves, down moves. Right now we're slightly higher in the week, but a moment ago we were slightly lower. So, again, it's going to be a really uh, right down to the wire relative to that CPI print and where is inflation. Now, of course, we have reports right now of massive food inflation. We're seeing something for the first time that we've seen since 1981. That is double digit increases for both food and for uh, energy. And here's back to 20, uh, uh, October of 2021. Food up just 3.2 percent. We'll take a look at this now in May, up nearly 12 percent. It's just incredible how much we have seen uh, food absolutely rising. We're also seeing something unusual relative to the 210. Now it is narrowing or tightening, I should say, uh, in sharply over the last year or so. Uh, but the two year right now at its highest level, I think at 281 the last time I looked, uh, the highest level since 2018, that 10 year yield at 303. So it's going to be interesting to see whether or not we tighten more and maybe go back toward the inversion we saw in early April. As for some of the top stocks on the day, let's take a look at what we have going on here. And NXP semiconductors up 8.2% on speculation from a blog uh, that there could be some M&A action there, a possible uh, buyout. Tesla 
of 5.5 percent on news that its output uh, in China uh, in the month of May tripled despite the lockdowns. We also have an upgrade from UBS to an outperform. And then finally rounding it out, Costco up 2.4 percent, a piece of that inflationary story, Alex. All right. Thanks so much, Abigail. And to that point, um, U.S. natural gas buy stockpiles actually rose 97 billion cubic feet last week. That was actually a bit more uh, than the week before. So we're getting a little bit of stockpile that's probably only going to get worse now that you have an LNG export terminal shut down for a couple weeks. So part of this energy story that Guy and I were just talking about, um, it's so bad now that President Biden went on Jimmy Kimmel last night and talked about many things, but in particular the gas crisis. Inflation is the, is, is, the, is the bane of our existence. Inflation is mostly in food and in gasoline at, yeah. at the pump. Oil companies, instead of everybody says, well, Biden won't let them drill, they have, they have 9,000 drilling sites that they've already owned that are there. They're not doing it. You know why? Because they make more money not drilling and buying back their own stock. Uh, you know when a president goes on a late night talk show, like it's getting serious. That approval rating is pretty grim. Let's get more insight now on what happens to commodities. Francisco Blanche, who's global head of commodities derivatives research over at Bank of America. Uh, great to see you in person. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Alex. Great to be here. So help us. You've had 120 target on uh, Brent for a while. What's right. going to be the top here? Well, um, I think uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, the, the crisis in the oil market hasn't arrived yet. Um, and I don't say that lightly because I think we've been in a, in a massive global gas and power crisis for the last um, 18 months or so uh, with prices of natural gas in, in Europe being close to $500 per barrel of oil equivalent, right? Um, and we've also seen recently, because of all the disruptions created with, with Russia, um, thermal coal prices rising to $100 a barrel of oil equivalent. So. When essentially sand or dirt on a, on a barge is trading at $100 a barrel, mm -hmm. you look at oil at 120, doesn't seem that expensive. Um, so I think we are uh, not at the peak yet. Uh, the pressure is going to continue. Um, but the one thing I'll say is that despite all the pain that we're seeing at the pump in this country, um, the US is so much better off than everybody else. Because remember, we have record. Uh, record dollar values, meaning we have an incredibly strong dollar um, with strong commodity prices, which means the pain at the pump in Europe and it's Asia and everywhere else is way, way worse. So that's, that's a big issue. So I think, I think we're going to get some demand destruction. We're getting, we're getting some demand destruction. Yep. Um, but, uh, but, but again, prices have to do a lot of work because we don't have the supply, Francis Alex. What, what does, you, you used the word crisis just a moment ago. We're not, we're not there yet. What does the crisis look like in your mind then? Well, we think, uh, depending on how the sanctions go in Europe, we could see uh, the European sanctions on Russian energy. We could see maybe $150 a barrel, maybe a little higher. But I don't think this is going to be a, a, a three-month issue, a six-month issue. Uh, we need to fix the supply side. And it's a very, very hard thing to do. Um, it's, it's not just about uh, returns. Uh, remember, the energy sector has had terrible yeah. returns for the last few years. We've had three bear markets in energy in 16, 18, and 20. So it's not just about buying back stock. Uh, the, the history is pretty bad for energy investors. Oh, sorry, uh, just, to, just to, so you, you don't think it's, this is, when you say it's not a three-month or a six-month problem, right. is the implication there that it is a more than three- or six-month problem? Yes, I mean, I think we're moving into, into a, probably a multi-year issue if, if the Russia-Ukraine situation doesn't solve itself out and we start to see uh, flows from Russia normalizing over the course of the next 12, 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and really, the, the big challenge here is that um, to fix the supply side, we also need to provide industry with some guidance as to how we're going to accomplish the energy transition. Because we did stop investing in thermal fuels, partly because of the poor returns, but also because... We were supposed to be driving electric vehicles by the end of the year. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and at the same time, we kind of forgot to invest in metals. Yeah. Um, right? and, and, and that's, in essence, I think you can blame an oil company for buybacks or whatever, but why are they going to invest in something that everyone wants to phase out? That's a really hard thing to kind of wrap your mind around. So does that mean that, at one fi that we could see one a spike to 150, or is this a sustainable spike to 150? Because even if we get a resolution of the, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I mean, I can't imagine all of a sudden Europe's going to go great and go buy at market value Russian oil anymore. 
Well, I mean, that's, that's a great point. We definitely need to uh, up our, our investment in the energy sector. And, and one of the challenges, again, I mentioned $500 a barrel gas in Europe, mm -hmm. but before $500 a barrel gas, we had a spike to 350, and before that, we had a spike to 250. And right. what that's done to European demand for gas is it's knocked it down three times over the course of the last nine months. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to tell you, and, and another way to think about this, is we were looking for 3.5 million barrels a day of oil demand growth globally this year in 2022. We're looking to get back to $100 a barrel. 100, uh, sorry, 100 million barrels a day. Um, the challenge is we don't have the supply. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we can only grow our demand by 2 million barrels a day as opposed to 3.5. So to yep. slow down the rate of demand growth, we just need a higher price. Now you're saying, okay, Francisco, so we have no inventories. We have this tons of money in the economy and people want to spend, buy. We don't have the supply. Therefore, in order to bring demand down, we just need a higher price. And that's exactly what's going on. You can call it stagflation. I call it, we have no supply, we have no inventories. And therefore, prices have to do the work for us. That's it. Can we just talk a little bit about the, the actual mechanics of getting molecules around the world? Um, Europe sure. desperately is in need of gas from around the world, not Russia in the, in the scenario you're painting. How, at the limit, is the current supply chain for gas? We've just seen a big fire. It, it's had a significant impact in terms of pricing. Um, are we trying to squeeze every single molecule we possibly can through liquefaction plants right now? And if so, how volatile could the environment be? How easy is it going to be to knock that supply chain story off course? Well, Guy, I mean, I'll just say, summer of 2020, European TTF gas was a dollar. March 2022, European TTF was $80 per MMBTU. We've gone from one to 80. I mean, can we get more volatile than that? I mean, it almost feels like a cryptocurrency at this point. Yeah. Um, it, it's an incredibly volatile environment because we have a very messed up supply system. We need to expand not just LNG export capacity, we also need to expand storage infrastructure in the US, in Europe and Asia, more pipeline capacity. I mean, just to put it into context, the amount of gas that Europe buys from Russia equates the amount of gas that China and Japan buy from the global LNG markets every year. Now, do we have the ability to create two Qatars overnight to essentially cut Russian gas from the European supply system? It's going to be a pretty hard thing yeah. to do. So, look, I'm not, I'm not kind of giving you a lot of good answers here, but I think prices are. And, and to your point, the volatility of, of, of the commodity markets is, is going to stay incredible because, again, all I'm saying here is we're going to see more inflation, more volatility, more basis risks. And again, basis risks mean risk to the term structure of commodity mm -hmm. markets, risks to the different prices across different regions, pr the prices of different commodities, corn versus wheat, gasoline versus oil. Well, All of that's going to be very volatile. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because this is uh, so M Live is doing a big commodity theme this week, and the question they have is, what's going to be the best performing commodity in the back half of the year, and then the worst? And it's hard to pick, right? Because there's so many that have so many supply issues. Right. That that is right, and I think I think the the the, the, the big issue here is going to be, I think, uh, uh, how do you how do you address? I think on the on the energy side, um, look, coal prices are so expensive, and we are. I think eventually going to get some response on the coal side, potentially, although we've had an election in Australia that may tilt the supply of the world's second largest exporter. So maybe we can get some relief there. Uh, U.S. natural gas, if we have a warm winter, could end up being the worst performing commodity. Because remember, even though we're $8, $9 per MMBTU, warm weather into the winter will bring U.S. natural gas down to 3 bucks an MMBTU. Um, so that could be one, I think, on the energy side, where we get a lot of relief. But again, we need the weather. And I'm telling you, yep. we, we are right now, you ask Guy this question, are we on the edge? Yes, we're on the edge. I mean, there's, energy supplies are, are limited, growth is, is still very robust, and China is in lockdown. Um, I think the best performing commodities of the year, if China comes out of lockdown, could be commodities, could be jet fuel, could be some of the metals that have been depressed mm. because China was, was um, uh, scaling back demand. Um, so that, that's how I think about it. And then, of course, there is the food issue, which... That one is a lot more difficult to forecast because of what Russia right. is doing to the Ukrainian um, agricultural sector. So, so, so I, I don't think the issues are going to go away. Um, and I even think a recession will not be a, a fix 
I think we'll see mm. some recessions in different parts of the world, but I don't think it's going to be the fix yep. that we're hoping for because there's no, no much substitution across the complex and because everything is so tight. So even if, if demand comes down a bit, a, a little bit, um, that, that's not necessarily going to resolve the multi-year problem that we have ahead of us here. Mm. Francisco, great to catch up. Great to see you in the studio. Thank you very much indeed. Alex always laughs at me and tells me kind of that I'm an Englishman watching the weather. I think we should all watch the weather. I think it's going to be really important. <laughs> but you talk about Francisco. it all the time. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> well, we do. But it's important, as you just heard. I've just been backed up by Francisco. Francisco uh -huh. Blanche of Bank of America. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up, Wall Street's top regulator is setting up for a fight over stock market rules with some of the biggest names in equity trading. We're going to talk about that story next. Joe Moglia, Fundamental Global Investors Chairman and former CEO of TD Ameritrade, joining us next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Liz Ann Saunders, the Charles Schwab Chief Investment Strategist, joining Bloomberg Television, 3.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. SEC Chair Gary Gensler proposing a set of sweeping changes aimed at making the U.S. equity market more transparent and fair for retail investors. Let's break that down with Bloomberg's Shanali Basic. We have payment for order flow versus an auction process. Walk me through what we have now and what could change. Yeah, so right now it's exactly what it sounds like. Market makers will pay a brokerage for order flow. The idea here being that they share some of the profits made from the spreads when it comes to trading. That's what keeps retail trading prices zero in many cases. Robinhood, though, makes about 80% of its revenue just from uh, processes tied to just this in equities and options markets. So that's paying for order flow. The worry for Chair Gensler here is that he's worried that it may not be the best things in all cases for retail trading clients. So what is yep. he considering? He's considering an auction process, which is exactly what that sounds like, auctioning for the best execution here and auctioning for those trades. Remember, there's a third option here, which is internalization, and it's when brokerages handle their own order flow as well. The challenge here, guys, is going to be incentives. Shirley, you talk to a lot of people. <laughs> is the consensus that payment for order flow is probably on its way out here? Something that's interesting about this guy is the data. Market makers are really asking for more data behind what is really best. When it comes to payment for order flow, we have some data in terms of what is being paid from the brokerages or it's for the market makers to the brokerages. But what is getting the retail investor the best price? Bloomberg Intelligence's Larry Tab has done some work on this already. And he's found that when you're paying for order flow, retail investors are capturing 47 percent of the spread. What does that mean? That's 39 percent for market makers and 13 percent for brokerages. So you are seeing the retail investor get the most of that price improvement. Uh, can the S SEC show which model is best in a data-driven way. We haven't seen a full analysis yep. of what that could look like yet. I think that would be really interesting and maybe answer the question that we're trying to figure out here. Shinali, thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg, Shinali Basak, let's carry on the conversation. Joe Moglia, Fundamental Global Investors and Capital Wealth Advisors Chair. He's the former CEO, of course, of TD Ameritrade. Joe, does the system need changing? Do you think Gary Gensler is on the right track here? Or are we good as we are? No, we actually had a conversation about this one, the whole meme thing and GameStop and Robin Hood and Melbourne Capital and, and Citadel crises was going on. And one of the things that I said then is that the regulated job, the assistant job, come in and find out, was there wrong to somebody really to take advantage of the system? And if they did, and if they did something wrong in order to take advantage of, they're supposed to be held accountable. And then mean, always when you do something like that, is there something that they can improve? But all of that doesn't have anything to do specifically with payment for order flow. Robin Hood, when they had to stop trading, that doesn't do, have anything to do with payment for order flow. The Citadel issue doesn't have anything to do with payment for order flow. And the Citadel hedge fund, man. the Melbourne Capital thing, that wasn't an issue with payment for order flow. I think Chanel did a very good job of kind of walking through what some of the options are. I think it might make sense to walk through this from an investor's eye. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hey, Joe, okay, you know so, what? Joe, we're having a little yeah. bit of problem with your audio. If there's a way we can maybe tweak it. It's really hard to hear what you're saying. While we focus on that, Joe, uh, let's go back to Shanali for a moment. Um, Shanali, 
what part of the system is actually broken that we do need to fix? That's what I'm kind of struggling with. Well, what's interesting is people don't understand there is a lot of disclosure around payment for order flow. This happens at least quarterly where you see exactly how much every market maker is paying every brokerage. But what you don't get as much clarity into is, is the retail investor getting the best yeah. deal at the end of the day? What, so what problem are we trying to solve here? It's what the retail investor gets. What happened after the GameStop saga, yeah. I think a lot of retail investors didn't even know that their order flow was being paid for, that that, that was the business but, model, but, right? But, Shanali, are we at, I want to come back to what you were saying just a moment ago. We need to see the data that tells us that the consumer is getting a bad deal here. Until we see that data, are we certain that the consumer is getting a bad deal and that things need fixing? Yeah, I think one really interesting question is internalization and the, the difference in the models. If the SEC is looking at one model, are they looking at any other models as well? And are those models at risk at all? Is the consumer getting a lesser deal anywhere in the picture here? Mm -hmm. uh, another interesting thing that we haven't talked about at all, that many people haven't talked about yet, is what this will look like in the future for crypto exchanges. Because right now, crypto exchanges are able to make a lot more money per trade and there's a sense that that will also go to zero one day, similar to how stocks do as well. So the implications that we're seeing in the equity markets could have a lot further reaching consequences. Also, I was reading um, a piece out that talked about how if you did an auction model, that's OK for uh, high liquid stocks. But for smaller, smaller traded equities, there's just not you just can't do it. So yeah. in some ways, it's going to actually funnel out certain uh, assets that people can trade. You know what? Something that's interesting that hasn't been discussed a lot is Citadel Securities. Ken Griffin, when he went to Congress, one of the proposals he made was to make markets clearer, more transparent, fairer, was to uh, decrease the tick sizes from mm. for less than a penny here. That is something we've heard a lot of the big exchanges also talk about. So are we going to get to a place where there is tension consistently between the market makers and the SEC? Yep. Or is there going to be working together here to get a system that works fairly for everybody? Shani, we don't have payment fraud to flow over here. Presumably it must be fairly easy, therefore, to compare and contrast the different models. I, Europe doesn't do it. Therefore, if we look at what is happening to consumers over here, shouldn't we be able to get a good idea of what could happen to consumers over there? Or is the market fundamentally different? That's a great question. You know, in the heat of the GameStop kind of blow up. I don't want to call it a blow up. It, it worked well saga. for a while, mm -hmm. right? The saga, yes. So remember, we spoke to Citadel Securities. We spoke to Joe McCain, and he said around that time, retail trading accounted for about 25 percent on the greatest days of U.S. equity trading. It could be a lot less than that some days. But remember, is it a good thing that there is a marginal buyer in this market? Mm -hmm. uh, re uh, payment for order flow has helped facilitate that. Now, if the auction process goes on, remember, Citadel Securities is paying Robinhood, right? So that is a cost to them. The question, too, here is can they maintain those volumes once the model changes uh, from paying for the order flow to an auction process? Shanali, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for jumping in and staying with us. Shanali Batsik joining us from Bloomberg. Hopefully, we'll get uh, Joe Moglia back, former TD Ameritrade Securities. We're working on his audio now. This is Bloomberg. So we've been trying to fix the sound for our conversation with Joe Moglia. He's back now. We think we've done it. Technology is a wonderful thing. Joe, <laughs> we hope this is going to work, so let's give it a go. I hope so, Joe, too. I hope so. There you, you sound perfect. There we go. Look, that sounds Good. great. Joe, Good. is there a problem that needs fixing here? What do you think Gary Gensler's up to? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think there is a real problem. Now, when all this happened, when all this happened originally, and everything was blowing up, now I'm talking about Robin Hood and Citadel, and Melbourne Capital, I recommended then that the SEC definitely get involved. And if somebody did something wrong, they're supposed to be held accountable. And while you're going through this entire process, it'd be really truly do something great. But the SEC's job is to really try to protect, but trying to protect the individual investor. So my suggestion is, if it's okay with the two of you, why don't we walk through exactly what happens to the individual investor and see to what extent there's a problem there? Does that make sense? Yeah, do it. Go ahead, Joe. Okay, all right. So I'm the individual investor. I want to place a trade. I had a trade, I hit go. I, that goes through the brokerage firm and winds up going to the market maker. The market maker has a bid offer spread. 
right? That's a little bit of a spread between whether you buy, whether you sell, and they create a price, which has to be the best price in the marketplace. You guarantee the best price for the brokerage. They keep a piece of that for themselves, the market maker. Now the brokerage firm then decides how much of that, that payment, that's the payment order flow, how much of that payment they, they, they want to actually give to the client and actually improve that client's price or how much they want to keep for themselves. Uh, most of the time, they give a the biggest chunk to the individual investor. In fact, at Schwab, 95% of all their trades are price improved. Now, and this happens instantaneously. Okay, so now I'm the individual investor. What did I just get? I got instantaneous execution. I got a guarantee they got the best price in the marketplace. And by the way, I got price improvement most of the time, and this is for free. This is for free. That sounds like an incredible deal to me. All right, now, let's look behind the scenes. You get all this done, there's incredible, there's a gazillion dollars worth of technology. There, there's there's, there's oh, the regulatory issues that got to be handled. That costs a tremendous amount of money. It's the payment for order for yep. that. And that allows then the, the, the broker firm to, 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 to charge zero commission to the individual investor. The individual investor is in good shape here. If they screw around with payment for order flow, then there's a possibility that the way to offset that, broker firms then, then start, start to charge commission. Uh, what, what could be, Joe, great what, could be right now. what could be the next best model? I think this model works pretty well. Now, I know they're talking about an auction model. Well, depending on what they look at, depending on how that works, depending on what the data says, that's worth looking at. So I think all these things might be worth looking at. But there's so many things going on, I think, in terms of Wall Street. Think about what's done with SPACs, that the SEC can be devoting more time and energy on. That this... The individual investor, if that's who they're trying to take care of, has never had it better in the history of Wall Street. So now's not the time to fool around with that because that part's not broken. Um, Joe, do you think that there's something to be said for the fact that the SEC doesn't want mom and pop traders in the market, that they don't want that to happen because of the risk then that individuals can take? Well, I don't know if that's their prerogative, though. No, so individuals have the freedom to be able to do what they want with regard to the market. Now, I don't think it would be a bad idea to make sure that, that there's better education provided with the individual investor. So if you go back to the, to the, to the meaning craze, um, uh, to what extent were, did, did Wall Street help the individual investors understand their risk? So if you bought GameStop at 10, do you sell it at 20? Do you sell it at 40? Do you sell it at 200? Where do you sell it? What happens when the market turns around and starts to come down? You actually have leverage involved. So these are the things that I think the individual investor needs to understand. I don't think it would be a bad idea for the SEC to require better education where individual investors, for example, have to pass some sort of test if they want to be able to trade themselves with, with, with regard, to, uh, with, with regard to, to the marketplace. I don't think that's a bad idea at all. And that's good enough to be right. a payment for them. That's a good idea, in fact. I think that would be good. Joe, what does what your gut tell you? Does your gut tell you that the SEC is going to take action here? Does your gut tell you the payment for order flow is on its way out? No. That, that's, when I began in Ameritrade in 2001, it was the first time I really became familiar with payment for order flow. And I thought then it might go away. But then I realized the impact that it positively had. And it never, it never ever was really, it comes up all the time, but it was never challenged. And I think with what Genst is doing now, it's making, it's making it so public. They're going to have to do something. Otherwise, I think he looks silly. But if they tamper with payment for order flow, they are fooling around with something that, that, that is, is not an issue to the individual investor, and they are creating far greater expenses uh, for, 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 the, for the brokerage firm and the Wall Street community. There's no good reason to increase the expenses on Wall Street. And if you do that, to what extent does Wall Street upset that? Do they now come back and now, now, now charge commissions? So I worry with that what they're trying to take care of, the individual investor, can easily have adverse uh, ad adverse circumstances, adverse impact. Hey, Joe, uh, last question here. If I'm Morgan Stanley and I own E-Trade, what am I thinking right now? Well, I think all along, I think uh, James Gorman and the people that actually run E-Trade, as well as all the other firms, uh, they recognize that there may be an issue here. And this is something that they talk about every year when, they, when, they, when they're doing their, their strategic plan. And But we don't know what's going to happen. So I don't think if I'm running E-Trade, I don't want to spend too much time worrying about something that I don't know which way it's going to go. But I have to have already created a system, both from a strategic perspective and a technology perspective, that I've got the ability to be able to adapt and adjust the contingencies as they pop up. 
So if I get hit with something that's different than what it is today, I should be able to adapt and adjust. Hey, Joe, we really appreciate it. We appreciate your patience. We'll definitely make sure the audio is good next time we have you on. It'd be good to follow up. Uh, Joe Amoglia, okay. Fundamental uh, Global Investors Chairman that. and former TD Ameritrade CEO. Thank you very much. Guy, over to you for Market Check. Yeah, 30 minutes to go until the end of trading here in Europe. And wow, Christine Lagarde has certainly had an effect on these markets. Let me talk you through the price action uh, and show you what's going on. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes or so definitely talking about what comes next for the ECB. What's happening right now? Stocks are down. We're down by around 1.2%, trading 4.35. Um, but I think the action is actually, by and large, concentrated elsewhere. And I think it's here and here. The Italian 10-year yield is up by 21 basis points today. Spread to widening out. Christine Lagarde spent a lot of the ECB press conference talking about fragmentation and the risk of it and how the ECB would deal with it. The problem with the answer to the last bit is that she didn't really have one. Incredibly vague. So what we got was peripheral yields blowing out and we got the currency going down. And that's probably not the combination that she was looking for. So we're trading euro dollar 106.47. Uh, we're down by around six tenths of one percent. BTPs, as I say, are up by a whopping 21 basis points. Now, I covered the, the, the Eurozone debt crisis. That, that's nothing, obviously. It could go significantly further than this. Uh, and uh, certainly people are going to be watching very carefully what happens here. Spreads are widening out. What tools could be used, Alex, if we were to see them going even further? Yeah, she really punted that uh, to the next meeting. Here in the U.S., we're just kind of along for the ride today. I think it's about U.S. CPI tomorrow. Just what kind of aid handle are we going to get? Uh, however, within the market, we are seeing the S&P a little softer, five tenths of one percent. Uh, yield selling off in sympathy, but like barely anything compared to BTP's yield, just up three percent. Two idiosyncratic things. One, Carnival down by about seven percent yet again today. Yesterday, the whole cruise line industry got some downgrades uh, over at Morgan Stanley. We're having some follow through selling again today that had been really with the action around the reopening trades, now firmly to the downside. Flip side, NXP Semi up seven percent. I find this interesting guy because. Um, you had Intel warning earlier this week on demand, basically, in a tough macro environment. That raised the question, are, are chips still cyclical? And if that's the case, will prices wind up coming down, and are we seeing that demand destruction? And XP, though, said something very different at a B of A conference. The senior vice president of the company uh, spoke earlier, uh, saying that demand is really strong. Demand is an excess of supply. So maybe we yep. have an idiosyncratic issue with Intel, but I think that the state of the semi-industry is definitely one to watch in terms of determining where certain prices can come down. Different chips, different markets maybe. We'll keep an eye on yep. that one, certainly. What we're focusing on right now is what happened today with the ECB. So the ECB on the road today, remember it does that twice a year. Today in Amsterdam, committing to a quarter point increase uh, in interest rates next month. Apparently, the whole idea that we never pre-commit, you know, we've thrown that one out of the window. Then there's the potential idea that we could get a 25 hike in September. We could also potentially get a 50 basis point hike in September. Here is President Lagarde at today's news conference. The new staff projections foresee annual inflation at 6.8 percent in 22 before it is projected to decline to 3.5 percent in 23 and 2.1 percent in 24, higher than in the March projections. This means that headline inflation at the end of the projection horizon is projected to be slightly above our target. So, let's go to Amsterdam. Let's join our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who is there uh, with Christine Lagarde in Amsterdam. Maria, we know we're going to get 25 basis points at the next meeting. My question is, how much clarity do we have beyond that? Well, Guy, I mean, you heard it there. She said we're doing 25 basis points because that was the guidance to the market, and we want to stick with that, of course, repeating, uh, by the way, something we all knew was going to happen, but to uh, the asset purchase program coming to an end within the next few weeks, and this marks a new era for the European Central Bank. Where we go from there, well, they've also put on paper, but she also said it uh, verbally in that press conference, that there will be another hike in September. I think the focus now is do they stick with the guidance up until a few weeks ago that that could be 25 basis points or actually you go bigger than that, particularly in light of the inflation data that we have over the past two weeks across the euro area. To me, it was striking that, of course, that question came up time and time and again. She did not push back on the 50 basis points narrative. And I think from now until September, essentially, that's going to be the debate in markets. Just how hard will it go in September?
All right, Maria, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo uh, joining us there. Um, joining us for a deeper look is Peter Pret, former ECB chief economist. Peter, you're one of the best guests to talk to uh, about the situation in the ECB today. I think the real question is, 2024, we're looking at inflation above the central bank's 2% target. When and how can they actually get inflation down to 2%? I think in the projections, you see a figure of 2.1%. So I think it's very really trivial. You know, when you think of the, the range of forecasting, you know, errors, I mean, it's, it's really, you are at the objective. Now, when the staff does uh, their projections, they use basically uh, the market, you know, uh, interest rates, the project, you know, the future rates. And so you could, you could argue uh, that uh, what Christine Lagarde basically announced today is that she endorses basically market prices for the risk-free curve. Uh, so that means a hike, you know, a series of hikes of rates up to, I would say, 175, something like that, around 175. So it's, as she explained, it's a journey. It starts with 25. September very likely is going to be 50 basis points. But very importantly also, she, she, she said, you know, that beyond September, there will be further increase in interest rates. So all in all, I thought this uh, press conference on more on the hawkish side, with a small hawkish surprise, uh, not a big surprise, but really what uh, what really annoys me uh, in the communication first is that uh, Christine Lagarde deviated actually from what she said in the block, you know, two and a half weeks ago, where she said, you know, the euro area is not in a situation of excess demand, and so if you use interest rate, you know, to compress what to compress aggregate demand, usually that's what you want to do. So I think that was not very clear, you know, what you try to achieve, you know, by this sequence of interest rate hikes uh, and what sort of excess demand are you dealing with? So I think that's that's something, you know, they, 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 they should clarify. The other thing is yep. that the more hawkish you are on rates, the more you should clarify, you know, the transmission, you know, to via the spreads, you know, the country spreads. And that disappointed, I, would, I think, the markets. That's why you, you got this reaction. <laughs> there was a lot in there, Peter. Let's try and break it out oh, a little yeah. bit and, and deal with deal with it in, in its various component parts. So we get 25 this time well, in July, and then you're suggesting that it looks like a done deal that we get 50. So let's deal with that first of all. Why not go 50 in July if you're going to go 50 in September? Well, I mean, they could have done that, frankly. They could have done the, the 50. But, could you have know, or in this should sort have? Of well, I think, you know, you have to be careful, you know, when, when, you know, this is a big change in monetary policy, so they want to be careful. Uh, I think it's the, the logic is to be gradual. She explained that, Christine Lagarde explained that in the blog. And so she, they want to, to start, you know, with, uh, with, with 25. Uh, I, think, I think they could have done more. Uh, but I think the main problem is to explain, you know, what do you try to achieve? What is the situation? Yeah. I think they're a little bit optimistic on, on mm -hmm. GDP growth. Because essentially, when you look at you know, the first half of this year, uh, probably GDP is going to be basically flat. Uh, and uh, so I, I think, you know, by, you know in, in the situation of uncertainty, you try to do you know, a sort of a gradual rule, you know, 25, maybe 25. The surprise of, of 50 basis points for, for September probably was you know, more hawkish uh, members mm -hmm. of the governing council have pushed for that. Peter. I would have gone for 25-25, you see, but, uh, but that's not the way, that's not what was decided. Peter, um, I'm looking at 10-year uh, BTPs. We're, we're, we're basically around 3.6%, okay? We're really not that far away anymore from 4. And I'm wondering um, what you think the ECB should announce, they clearly are talking about it, should announce to help support spreads. I think, uh, you, you know, the, the argument to deal with small increases, 25, 25, and, and be a little bit vaguer and have more optionality is precisely, you know, to observe what is the consequence of these moves on the whole, you know, financial condition setting. It's not only the spreads, but it's